One way I'd phrase it right now is that we're kind of seeing the failure of incrementalism. So a lot of people, the way they they engage politics, they think if we just get like our person in charge, we can start turning this around. <laughs> and then that person, either well-intentioned or not, gets eaten by the machine and the machine just keeps going. And then people say, well, if we only get the next person in charge, we can turn this around. And so all these kind of like small measures are just going against basically the Borg of, of the bureaucracy of the system of as things are designed. And historically, you tend to see kind of like things go on and on and on and on, and then a gigantic trend change. Mm-hmm. And that's when it really matters what the culture of the society is, because that's when you can get either very virtuous outcomes or horrific outcomes. And the way I would describe it is that when you look at like I approach financial systems in the way that I approach systems engineering, like uh, as though I'm analyzing a complex system, because that's what we're doing. And there's st- stable systems and unstable systems or marginally stable systems. And the financial system has all of the traits of an unstable system in the sense that for decades and decades, you have rising debt percentage of GDP, falling interest rates, which allows you to pay for those rising debts, even though you're getting rising debts. Basically, the interest expense is not rising. And then when you have a gigantic debt bubble, when you hit zero rates and you start going sideways to up in interest rates while you still have that very large public debt burden, that's when a lot of the things that keep getting there, that, you know, you kick the can down the road over and mm-hmm. over again, that's when it starts to materialize in the present. And that's when you look around and wonder, like, why is none of this working anymore? Why is this, you know, why is this getting increasingly bad? It's because we've kind of extended the system as far as it can go. Out of bullets. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're out of bullets. And now we're kind of dealing with the consequences of a system that always, you know, for the past, say, four plus decades or more, was always unstable. But that could be delayed, deferred, pushed onto someone else, often in the developing world. Yeah. Kind of push mm-hmm. that. But now a lot of these things are starting to hit in the present. Um, so we're there right now. Yeah, I think we've been there really since the global financial crisis. I think this is... um. I think this is a multi-step process. That's one thing I cover in my work is that basically these things historically, at least with the data we have and logically tend to go in two phases. You have kind of the private debt bubble blows up and then the response almost inevitably, not every time, but almost inevitably is to push that onto the public level. So you bail out the system, you bring all that debt or a lot of the debt onto the public level, some, some part of the private sector deleverage, and then the public debt part keeps building. And then the second hit is when the public debt bubble starts to have a problem. And I think that's that's the phase that we're in now. And that's still a multi-year process playing out. I would say one is that the more connected the world is, um, the more it's going to be a worldwide issue versus local issues. Um, you know, people that have seen the podcast before probably know that I often compare the 2010s to the 1930s and the yeah. 2020s to the 1940s. So there are a lot of elements back then. What's What's new this time is that most of these kind of long-term debt cycle or institutional cleansing cycle things that we go through, fourth hurting, whatever you want to call it, usually there's a changeover in the type of money we use. You go from, say, free banking to central banking uh, with a gold underlay. Then you go to uh, another central banking model. We don't even have a gold underlay anymore. And what we've never done before is go through one of these cycles when we were fiat currency going into it. So what comes out? Right? Do we've, we've never gone in this gigantic fiat currency global cycle, have a whole sovereign debt crisis on a global scale, <laughs> and then see what's on the other side of that. That's new. Not even just hyperinflation that can do it. It's it's the perception of the loss of control. Right. And so, for example, there are a lot of developing countries today where they're not in, say, outright hyperinflation. Yeah. They might just have double-digit inflation on a recurring, regular basis. It's like a background part of life. Mm. Um, and there's no expectation that they're going to get it under control. And that's that's kind of the world. That that's historically a developing market phenomenon, mm-hmm. and you can get that kind of situation in um, the developed world if this is left unchecked. I think that's kind of on the train we're going for. Is that you can call for kind of a central bank losing control, in the sense that there's there becomes no clear way where they can get it back down to their, you know, their kind of prior baseline of money supply growth and price level changes and things like that where there's too much public debt for them to tighten the way they want to. And then the the challenge is that when you have a lot of public debt, interest rates start losing their effect. Um, They become more complicated tools to try to slow down inflation um, compared to when you have lower public debt levels and higher private debt levels. Um, And so 
when I get questions on hyperinflation stuff, I kind of put that aside and I say, we don't have to be there for this to be a problem. Like if you look at right now, the market still generally thinks the Fed can get the current situation under control. And maybe for a few years they can, right? It's, you know, you can cyclically get it under control potentially. Um, so right now, whenever you see kind of a higher inflation print than expected, you'll see the dollar strengthen and you'll see other, you know, because they say, well, now the Fed's got to get even tighter, right? Because they're, they're, they're going to get this, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's the current kind of market reaction for how this is going. And when you go through the looking glass is when the market realizes they actually don't have control. Right. And we're not there yet, but I think we're on this kind of either multi-month or probably more realistically multi-year process of, of getting to that point within the 2020s, I think. Um, next next few years, perhaps, um, I think that what I look for is the ingredients that can lead to that. And I, and I then judge the probability that those ingredients are building. So one would be energy security. Yeah. Um, that's obviously in a dangerous spot right now. Um, and sometimes the problem goes away, but the structural issue is still there. Mm -hmm. So one would be energy security. And then the other one would be looking at the size of deficits, wondering how they're going to be financed, looking for any attempts to kind of improve the deficits, and then looking at the overall public debt to GDP ratios, because that's an indicator. 35%. Exactly. I'll never forget that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an indicator that starts to become relevant because when you get to that very high level and you raise rates, at the same time as you're pushing down the private sector by raising those rates, you're also greatly increasing the deficits. Um, and so if you imagine two numbers, if you imagine the US in the 1970s, you know, the US had 30% debt to GDP and most of the um, money creation was happening in the, in the private sector, not all of it, but a lot of it. And mm -hmm. um, when, so when Volcker raised rates very high in that period, um, it did two things. One, it slowed down bank lending because you now it's a much higher hurdle rate to borrow, but it also would increase the deficit to some extent because you know you're paying higher interest on your debt. But because that was so small, the negative impact on the private sector was much larger, meaning that those rate hikes were disinflationary. The problem is if you fast forward, let's even go past the current, let's go to Japan. If you have 250% debt to GDP and you have pretty slow bank lending, Almost all the money creation is really coming from the government deficits, the monetization mm. of those deficits. And so if you raise rates, you actually risk accelerating money supply growth because when you raise rates, the public interest expense will balloon significantly because you're doing it from a 250% that the GDP base, whereas you're not going to impact private sector lending much because that's already small relative to that. So huh. that's the problem is that as you get more and more debt on the public level, interest rates become a more mixed tool for addressing inflation and eventually can become literally a like a, uh, a negative tool for dealing with it. Lynn Alden, a well-known financial expert, is sounding the alarm about the future. She's genuinely worried about what's coming next in the economy. While she's been right before, we'll have to wait and see if her fears come true. It's a tense time for investors and economists, and they're keeping a close watch on her predictions as they prepare for what's ahead. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.